Hello everyone, this is Sirius Trivia and today we are continuing our Sun Tzu lore series with episode 6 titled The Fall of Zhong. So last episode, we left off as Sun Tzu collected Liu Yao's body alongside the Yuzhang commandery to complete his collection of the Jiangdong region. But there are still a few threats that remain in the south. While these threats are minor, they will all carry giant consequences for Sun Tzu down the line. So let's quickly explore these first. First up is the two men that was being sheltered by Xu Zhao. One of them is Yan Bai Hu, while the other is Xu Gong. When Liu Yao had died and Yu Zhang exchanged hands, Xu Zhao turned out to be long dead too. It turns out that the jungles of Yu Zhang not only caused the sickness that caught Liu Yao's life short, but it also claimed Xu Zhao's life well back in 195, when he had first retreated into this region. So with Xu Zhao dead, there is no one technically holding Sun Tzu back from killing these two remaining threats. In regards to Yan Bai Hu, he tried to plead his case as he offered to surrender to join Sun Tzu's faction, but Sun Tzu had no need for a cowardly and privileged bandit so Sun Tzu offered him the axe instead, as Yan Bai Hu was promptly executed. As for Xu Gong, Sun Tzu initially wanted to spare him, but when it was discovered that Xu Gong had been actually writing letters this whole time to Cao Cao, warning him how strong Sun Tzu had become, and even recommended Cao Cao to summon Sun Tzu back to the imperial court with a lucrative job offer, as a way to either stunt his growth or outright kill him. Seeing these letters, there is no way that Sun Tzu could spare Xu Gong, as Sun Tzu summoned him personally, showed him the letters as evidence, and then personally strangled him to death. And with that, the only hostile forces that remained in the south was Zhu Lang and his bandits, which had previously handed two defeats to Sun Tzu, but this time, Things were a lot different, as Sun Tzu's troop are now all seasoned veterans from conquering the entire Jiangdong region, and they enjoyed an overwhelming number advantage over Zulong's bandits. So Zulong fell without causing too much trouble, as he surrendered to Sun Tzu, who decided to spare him and even gave him the post in the military, as Sun Tzu respected him for his abilities as opposed to Yan Bai Hu's earlier attempt at surrendering. So at this point, Sun Tzu was finally ready to take on Yuan Shu, as he has full control of the south, but he wasn't going to do it on his own, as Yuan Shu was now public enemy number one. So if Sun Tzu plays his cards right with the imperial court, which means Cao Cao, he could end up getting paid in money and title, to do the job that he was going to do anyways. So by the end of 197, Sun Tzu sent in another batch of annual tributes to the imperial court, except this time, Sun Tzu doubled the amount compared to the previous year. And since the last tribute got him the generalship, administrator position, and a second marquis title, he expected much greater rewards this time. And sure enough, when the imperial herald visited him again the following year, Sun Tzu was promoted to the general who attacks the rebels, and his second Marquis title of Wucheng is also bumped up to the Marquis of Wu. But of course, Cao Cao wanted him to attack Yuan Shu as the price, which Sun Tzu was more than happy to oblige. So by the spring of 199, Sun Tzu, now working in a coalition with Cao Cao, Dong Cheng, and Liu Zhang, plotted a joint campaign to attack both Liu Biao and Yuan Shu, as Liu Biao was being seen by Cao Cao and thus the imperial court as an enemy. And before we proceed on with the course of this war, this list of participants here is quite interesting, as none of them are really friends with each other. Liu Zhang, who is Liu Yan's son, has now taken over the Yi province following his father's death. He decided to join this coalition mainly because Liu Biao had tried to steal the Yi province from him with the attack on the province not long after Liu Yan's death. So even though Liu Zhang, much like his father, did not care much about the political battles outside of the Shu region, he strongly disliked Liu Biao 
to the point where he was willing to work with Cao Cao. Meanwhile, Dong Cheng is also an unlikely ally here, as he is the nephew of the late Emperor Dowager Dong and the current father-in-law to the emperor, as his daughter Lady Dong was married to Emperor Liu Xie. So if you think about it, this is a marriage between second cousins, but disregarding that, Dong Cheng hated Cao Cao, and very soon Dong Cheng would, and very soon Dong Cheng would, and very soon Dong Cheng would actually make a attempt on Cao Cao's life that would ultimately fail and get his entire clan killed. But at this point, he probably hated Yuan Shu a bit more than Cao Cao, as Yuan Shu's dynasty of Zhong is a direct affront to the Han dynasty, and as the father-in-law to the emperor. And the current general of the chariot, which is a tier two generalship position, he wanted Yuan Shu dead, probably just as much as he wanted Cao Cao dead. But before this group of unlikely allies launched their campaign, news of Yuan Shu's death broke out as a series of defeats suffered by Yuan Shu against the likes of Liu Bei, Lu Bu, and Cao Cao's forces, combined with a bad harvest that severely punished the Yang province. And years of mismanagement from Yuan Shu, who cared very little about the will of the people and just lavishly spent on his concubines and his palace, triggered this massive famine within the Yang province, which led to tragic scenes of cannibalism and massive amount of death. And even Yuan Shu was not spared from this disaster from inside his palace, as even he could see the writings on the walls. And facing impending doom. He swallowed his pride as he bitterly wrote to his half brother Yuan Shao, pleading for help by offering to abdicate the throne to him. Now, while Yuan Shao didn't care very much about Yuan Shu's emperor title, as he could easily give himself an emperor title if he wished, he did feel that the pride of the Yuan clan was finally at stake, as Yuan Shu's pitiful defeats had brought shame to the whole clan. So Yuan Shao rolled back, explaining that it would be a bad look for him to actually send troop to help prop up his brother's failing dynasty, but he was willing to provide shelter for him if he manages to flee north. And seeing this, Yuan Shu quickly ordered his troops to pack up all his wealth as he looked to flee north to join his half brother. But things kept going wrong as Liu Bei's force was to the north of his position. And they blocked his path. And after a few failed attempts at breaking through to the north, the morale of the army cratered as troops deserted in masses. And those who stayed behind eyed their emperor's treasures with a greedy eye. Soon, as food and water supplies ran out, Yuan Shu, who had grown up spoiled in a household filled with exotic fruits from the Silk Road and drank only honey water. Could no longer tolerate the hardship of fleeing on the road, and in despair, Yuan Shu passed away from exhaustion, thirst, and depression, as he could not reconcile with himself how he, the great Yuan Shu, Emperor of Zhong, chosen by the Imperial Seal, ended up in this sorry state. And with his death, some of the troop stole the Imperial Seal as they fled to join Cao Cao, while other troops. Namely, generals like Zhang Xun, who had been Yuan Shu's grand commandant, feared that Cao Cao would not easily accept them as they were traitors to the state. So they actually decided to flee south to try to join up with Sun Ce, who they had gotten along quite well while under the service of Yuan Shu. But before they could cross over the Yangtze River, Liu Xun, who Yuan Shu had originally assigned to Lu Jiang in place of Sun Ce after Sun Ce had won the city over from Lu Kang's hands. Ended up cutting off them from escaping south to join up with Sun Ce, and forced them to join him instead. It turns out Liu Xun, who still had a large garrison of men after Yuan Shu's fall, thought he could become a warlord himself. So he wanted to absorb as much as Yuan Shu's old forces as possible in order to bolster his influence. Diplomatically, he had already secured an alliance with Huang Zhu, who was defending the city of Jiangxia to the west. And both of them knew that the rise of Sun Ce down south would put a target on their backs. And even Yuan Shu's remaining family member, namely his son Yuan Yao and his cousin Yuan Ying, decided that the best option for them at this point was to join Liu Xuan as well, since they also feared Cao Cao. 
So they ended up carrying Yuan Shu's body to Lujiang, where they buried him, as they sheltered under Liu Xun's protection. Back on Sun Ce's side, news of Liu Xun's rise and alliance with Huang Zhu were definitely concerning as Sun Ce planned out his next moves. And even though Sun Ce knew the layouts of the city of Wancheng, which is the capital inside Lujiang, where Liu Xun now garrisons in, as he had previously spent almost two years sieging it away from Lu Kang, he also knew from experience that this was going to be an incredibly hard city to siege, and with potential reinforcements from Huang Zhu and Liu Biao, Sun Ce knew that an upfront siege was definitely not the ideal approach. So Sun Ce resorted to some trickery here instead, as he decided to pin a letter to Liu Xun where he humbly presented himself as the same 19-year-old kid who had joined Yuan Shu's forces making a case that he still sees himself as an ally to Yuan Shu, and thus a subordinate to Liu Xun. He then goes on to suggest that they have a common enemy in front of them, in the form of a Han-held grain depot in Shangliao, which is this heavily defended small garrison to the north of Wancheng that holds nearly 30,000 dou of grain. Here, Sun Ce suggests that the two of them could easily team up and work together to take all this grain. And of course, once they succeeded, Sun Ce offers to just take a small amount for the few troops that he have and leave the rest to Liu Xun. And apart from this letter filled with flattering words and a tempting offer, Sun Ce also sent tributes to Liu Xun to show how much he respected him. And sure enough, Liu Xun took the bait as he let all this flattery go straight to his head, despite his advisors warning him that this could all be a trap. And indeed, it was a trap, as Sun Ce had no intention of teaming up with Liu Xun, as everything in the letter was a lie, since Sun Ce was now in fact much stronger than Liu Xun at this point. Sun Ce's only goal with this plan is to lure Liu Xun out of the defensive walls of the city of Wancheng, so that his armies can sneak up to the city and take it without a siege. Now of course, just taking the city isn't enough for Sun Ce. Eventually, he does have to deal with Liu Xun's army when they hear the news, as well as potential reinforcement from Liu Biao and Huang Zhu. But deep down in Sun Ce's heart, Sun Ce desperately wanted to get Liu Biao and Huang Zhu involved, since Liu Biao and Huang Zhu were directly involved in the death of his father, and since Sun Ce was still working with the imperial court, and Liu Biao remains a target even after Yuan Shu's death. So perhaps he can secure himself even more official recognition and power from Cao Cao if he ends up taking out Liu Biao. So to find out if Sun Ce can execute this plan to perfection and potentially avenge his father's death, come back next time as we continue our Sun Ce lore series with episode 7, titled Revenge Against Liu Biao. Once again, thank you all for watching, I hope you all enjoyed this episode, and see you all next time. Bye!